for me, it always comes back to spheres of influence. It's like, what can I do? What can I do with the power and privilege that I have in the environments where I have the capacity to make change or good trouble, as John Lewis would say, and then do that, focus on that. Um, because it, it, otherwise you get ground down and you're not able to be helpful, right? Um, so that's something I try to, you know, imbue in those, you know, you know, kind of build to in the classes that I teach that like there's learning about the past and learning how to see things clearly and carefully and, and to do that deep, slow dive into difficult works of literature trains us to be able to do that and to see things and to then act with that knowledge um, and, you know, in just better and more careful and more helpful ways, I think. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the English Department's Literature, Language, and Culture Dialogue Series. This is hosted on YouTube and podcast editions. My name is Jake Hipsch. I am your host today. And today's guest is Professor Kate Nareko. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Kate, would you mind telling folks a little bit about yourself and where they can find you online? Yes. So I am an assistant professor of English uh, here at UW, and I focus on uh, late medieval literature and culture, especially in England. Um, and you can find me on Twitter. I am uh, Professor Maleficent over there. Um, so at Prof Maleficent is my Twitter handle. The English department also has social channels that you can follow and join us in conversation. Our Twitter and Instagram are at UW underscore E-N-G-L and our Facebook is UW E-N-G-L no underscore. Please come and join us, leave a comment, subscribe and like. Also, if you're listening to the podcast, please consider leaving a comment there. It's always great to hear your thoughts and to have you join us in dialogue about these topics. I hope you enjoy this episode. So Kate, what did you bring to talk to us about today? So today I wanted to talk about the um connections between the research that I'm doing and the work that I'm doing on my book in, and digital project, but also how a lot of that work also connects very directly to what I do in the classroom, especially since so much of what I do is um, teach students about the Middle Ages who uh, have never taken a medieval studies class before. Um, and so in terms of the, um, the book, you know, I'm focused on a set of crusading romances um, that are all from the late 14th, early 15th century. But I end my book um, currently uh, with a uh, discussion of not just the medieval text in the coda, but also um, the film American Sniper, uh, David Bowie's song, Loving the Alien, and also um, the uh, Frank Miller's 300 and Holy Terror, because of the, the way in which, and also even more immediately things like Charlottesville and the way in which white supremacists have taken um, such a liking to uh, these kinds of texts. And, you know, the reason for that is because I um, think we become better readers of our now by figuring out what we've inherited from the past. And that's something that I directly kind of focus on in my classes as well and try to inspire students to, to find a sense of purpose in the work that they're doing, whether they're a chemistry major or um, are planning on majoring in English, that there is a, a deep sense of purpose to figuring out what we've inherited and figuring out in light of that knowledge, how we might make a better world. Because there have been a lot of books that have sort of, uh, whether it's uh, Greenblatt's The Swerve or that other book, you know, The World Lit Only by Fire, which is this, you know, this idea that like there was all this culture and art and science and all this amazing stuff in um, Rome and uh, you know ancient Greece and Rome. And then there was a thousand year quagmire where nothing happened. And then we had the Renaissance. Where, and, and getting them to think critically from the start about periodization is something that is very much kind of baked into what I do in every class. If the question is, what was this text trying to say? 
And if we're approaching the text as a cultural artifact, then there are certain, there are certain questions we also have to ask of ourselves <laughs> in order to feel confident that we're arriving at the kind of analysis we're striving for. I'm a big proponent of, of, of both using the tech, you know, looking at those texts as cultural artifacts, but also as a way into a kind of careful study of our present um, as well. Um, but I also, in my Chaucer class in particular, um, I offer students the option to do a creative assignment where they write a mid-quarter essay, which is focused on building their close reading skills of a medieval text. But it's like once they've done that work, then they're even more equipped to do that creative work where in full awareness of what the text has and doesn't have in terms of representation or um, a genuine acceptance of other cultures and religions, right? Um, they imagine different possibilities. In your work, and in your classroom, how have you helped students sort of take these texts that are artifacts? And how do you negotiate this translation into how do we see this yeah. in our world today? They'll give like a 20, 25 minute lecture at the beginning of class on a particular concept. And then we dive into the text in light of that information. And so on the day we talk about Beast Cleverett, um, and romance. I talk to them about the concept of courtly love uh, and the, the kind of triangular relationship and how, you know, it's debatable to what extent this was ever actually practiced in real life, but it was a major literary convention. It spurred just a bevy of troubadour poetry and literature focusing on relationships between men and women at the court. Um, you have, and then you have Andreas Kapalanis's, you know, The Art of Courtly Love, which, you know, there's a lot to say about the sincerity or lack thereof of that text um, and whether it's kind of, you know, playing with the convention. But there's a lot of stuff that um, in terms of who gets to love and be loved in this way and how exclusionary and classist it is that helps us to understand some of the horrific things that happen to women who are not of that noble class. Um, in, you know, in Chaucer, for instance, and in other medieval texts. Um, but Bees Clavret, you know, we, and I, in Bees Clavret and a lot of other romances, you know, you see this kind of triangular um, dynamic with you've got the lady who's on the pedestal and she's of a higher rank than the knight who is pining for her and writing poetry and courting her. And then she's married to, in a lot of cases, and it's not always, but in a lot of cases, it happens to be that young knight's lord, right? And it blows students' minds when they hear about this dynamic, because there was this kind of performing of courtly love, you know, in the, in the real world. And, um, and this was okay, but it framed lo love was always extramarital in these cases, romantic love, um, eros, right. Where, and that is just completely alien to, um, what most folks expect of, you know, a love, you know, marry each other. Right? Um, and so we talk about like, okay, so that's, that sounds very alien to our own cultural expectations of love leading to certain things and, and, and relationships, but let's talk about the, the um, desire, the matter of desire and power, right? And who actually has power in this situation and who does not. So on the surface and the way in which the Pining Knights and the Troubadour poems talk about um, these women is that they have complete power over these men. A lot of cases, these poets who are doing the kind of toxic brand of courtly love poetry, um, they, they'll they admit like in passing, like, oh, you don't even know that I love you or exist. So this woman has no idea, no idea that there's this pining man writing sad poetry for her. She didn't ask for this. She doesn't want this. And, and, and some of the poems make it emphatically clear. And um, what, I, what I do, uh, and I've done this several times now and it always works um, <laughs> very immediately. I, I walk them through that, you know, like, okay, so, you know, think about this, like in terms of uh, the more contemporary notion that we have been getting 
that we've been pushing against a lot in our culture of persistent pursuit and, and the privileging thereof. You know, look at the notebook, or look at, you know, say anything. And it's like all of these things that, you know, in the, in the actual world would um, get a restraining order slapped on you maybe, um, but are lionized as like, oh, you just need to keep pursuing and keep, even when she says, no, you just need to be persistent. And right. You know, and it's this message that is all over the place. Um, and I think we are seeing a bit of a paradigm shift, hopefully, in that, but it's very entrenched, very entrenched. And there's a lot of work to do. Um, and so I point this out to them that, you know, in this tr seemingly alien triangular dynamic, uh, where so much of it is very different and culturally and, and temporally speaking from our own moment, we can see the kind of same elemental, you know, concept of persistent pursuit who, and who gets put, who puts her there? She doesn't put herself on that pedestal. The men do. Right. And, um, and so that means that they're the ones who actually have power either to keep her there or to tear her down. And you see other romances that I, I mentioned in class and encourage students to seek out where they actually very, um, uh, kind of wonderfully point out that underbelly of this paradigm. But I, what I, but I don't just stop there. Um, I give them a, an example and it's a pretty, it's a, it's a pretty virulent example of the toxic form of troubadour poetry. It's by Bernard Aventadorn. And it has a lot of lines that when I encountered this poem the first time, it was right after the Santa Barbara shooting and that manifesto that came out. And what I do is I read this poem to them with a, a particular emphasis on certain lines um, of like, you know, I, it, that, that, are really um, casting aspersions on this woman just because she's not returning his advances. Um, and, and what I do is I don't tell the students the text that I'm reading, but I say, I'm now gonna read a text that was written just a few years ago. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but I encourage you, you know, once I'm done, if you know what it is, tell us and then we'll talk. And I read excerpts from the Shooter's Manifesto. And the student, there's always a couple students who, who recognize it right away. And some of the students laugh because it sounds so ridiculous. Um, but I remember the first time I did this, one of my students was like, y'all shouldn't be laughing. <laughs> you know, and he's like, I'm going to tell you why. He's like, I know exactly what that text is. And, and he said, uh, and everybody in the class is just, just like, Oh, wow. But the, but it's that immediate, you know, I, the, just the proximity of those two texts together. We talk about, okay, what do we do with this? Because those, that was a t early 13th century poem and a manifesto written by an incel in what, 2015, 16. Um, what do, how, and, and so it, it, it invites a couple of things to emerge. One being, um, wow, we've really, we're still working with a lot of these kind of, we can see very immediately how a, what seems like a silly troubadour poem and the elemental messages it's sending about who has a right to whom um, and who has a right to the attention of a, of a romantic, of a would-be romantic interest, how that can sometimes just lead to um, you know, misogynistic poetry, but in other cases taken to its extreme, it can lead to deadly violence, um, which we've seen an emboldening of thanks to the uh, men's rights movement and incel them, right? Um, and so, but then it also invites us to not let ourselves off the hook by assuming that the middle ages were just like, that was the bad time, right? And we've just ineffably gotten much, much better, um, you know, every day in every way, right? So it, it, it also does that kind of work that I encourage students to do from the beginning of dismantling these kind of, you know, overly comforting ideas of periodization that, um, you know, we can't just say that, oh, that's medieval. Bu building off of this. Yeah. Um, in the wake uh, of COVID-19, has there been texts or examples that have come up for you in your class or in your work that yeah. you directly have conversed with this current situation we find? 
I was teaching my Chaucer class in spring, this past spring. Um, and um, it, it's striking, uh, the partner's tale, which has the three young men in a bar in the middle of what seems to be the plague or plague outbreak. And they get, they get drunk and they decide that they're going to go kill death. And then, and so we end up with this, um, you know, story of these three men who end up, you know, killing each other basically. Um, but it's, and so that, that in and of itself is very different from, you know, and not talking about plague and pandemic, but the setting of it was something that the students and I were really, um, kind of fixated on. And we talked about in ways that I hadn't really focused on before. I mean, a lot of times, um, I'll, most of our conversation when we talk about the partner is about the partner himself and, and um, looking at some of the work uh, on, like, do we read him as transgender? Do we read him as genderqueer? What does that mean? How do we negotiate ideas of queerness then and now. Um, and we still talked about all of that, but I was really struck. And in terms of thinking about future teaching as well, just the idea that, um, you know, not in spite of, but even with these major outbreaks that wiped out how many people repeatedly throughout the, this time period, so much literature right? So much art, so much innovation. And so I find a certain kind of hopefulness, you know, as a medievalist, knowing what, and it's, it's given me, um, you know, a kind of renewed sense of um, purpose in that way about teaching this material that, because I do talk to my students about uh, how, um, you know, I ask the students, day one, all of my classes, because most of the students have never taken a medieval studies class before, even if they're taking an upper division one with me. And I asked them, I was like, okay, why do we study old stuff? Why? Why study a text that was written maybe, you know, you know, it was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Why? Um, and the students gravitate right away to a wonderful answer, typically, which is, well, to know where we come from and what we've inherited. And I'm like, that is true. It's absolutely true. Let's talk about that. So we talk about that and talk about how that'll work into the, the kind of, you know, rolling up our sleeves kind of work that we're going to be doing with these texts all quarter. But I also offer them something else that they all kind of, you know, <laughs> cock their heads a bit at first. And I say, it also has the ability. It's not going to just ineffably happen, but it does, reading old texts also has the ability to help you be become a more empathetic person. And they're like, what? That I wasn't expecting that. And I'm like, okay, what <laughs> hang in there. And it's like, okay, so Beowulf wasn't written for you. Wasn't written for you. Never could have been never could have imagined you. Uh, so in order to, as I said earlier, look at approach that text as a cultural artifact and see it, you know, as best we can in its context and what it has to teach us, um, we're setting ourselves aside, right? And trying to, as best we can, and it's always kind of impossible, but it's the effort of trying to set aside what we need and what we need a text to be um, in order to encounter it on its own terms. Um, and that, elementally, is the same kind of work we do when we are trying to empathize with another person. Um, so it's practice and it's hard. It's, you can feel your brain getting squeezed when you're, do, when you're doing that work, especially if you're not used to doing it all day in and day out um, as, a, you know, as a trained uh, you know, PhD medievalist, right? And so I tell them, it's like, it's hard. It's a, it's a workout, um, but that's the necessary work. And so, you know, in the end, you don't remember what happened in chapter, in, certain line of Beowulf, you can go read it. That's not what I'm invested in. That's not what I'm worried about. That's why I'm not doing reading quizzes um, unless you guys stop talking in class. Um, <laughs> uh, I said, the, but the important thing for me is that, you know, whether you never read a medieval text again, you come away from a class like this with a better sense of what, of the relevance of this time period, but also with a set of skills, not just writing based, but also just, you know, reading based and um but you know empathy based that will allow you to move through the world as ethically and as uh you know empathetically as possible
with your class and with your work, what do you hope to offer as hope for students? How do you want to prompt or inspire students into a space of hope? Yeah, you know, I, um, yeah, that is, that's something I think about a lot because especially in classes where we're repeatedly confronting these sort these various, you know, societal underbellies, right? Taking our current moments call to intersectionality as many um, black activists have stressed and, and you know, and, and tirelessly um, we're looking at proto white feminism here. We're not looking at proto-feminism in any truly intersectional way that is trying to move women forward and reckon with racial and classist, um, you know, imbalances that inform how certain women are treated over others. And so I, um, but I, I, I tell them though, it's like it's important. To it's like you know because I can tell that there are some of them are like oh man like it's like I, I really, like this is not like it's like oh this is so disappointing right and, and so I I try to move them into a space of of action uh, there and say well what can we do with this knowledge it's like by training ourselves to see these things it makes us more attuned to them and more able to readily confront them. Whether it's you know responding critically to a um, a movie that we see that just has all this uh, stuff baked into it that you now are seeing in a different way because of how we talked about those things, and so you know even though the content might be out of necessity, kind of heavy and distressing um, at times, that the purpose of it is where the hope kind of kicks in, that the goal here is to get under the hood and become more engaged readers of the world so that we can make better futures. As uh, you know, Chaucer, uh, Chaucer doth tweet, I always tell my students to follow him at the end of the, uh, it, it's the handle run by uh, the Chaucer blogger, Brantley Bryant. Um, and it's, he's wonderful. And he has this great kind of faux Middle English quote that, that I put up on the screen at the end of my, my medieval content classes. And it says, you know, study the past, not to prop up rusty and dusty futures, but to see what we've inherited and so make better futures, right? And it's, it's something that many people have said over and over again. I love it in the uh, the faux middle English, though. It has a nice little lilt to it in terms of getting us to that point and ending on that note and, and having that be our kind of takeaway is I actually, I read um, the refugees speech from the kind of that Shakespeare wrote as a kind of in a collaboratively written play about Thomas More. And Thomas More is talking to the crowd as they're about to go after the, you know, European refugees who have come in and are taking their jobs and are doing, I mean, so all, all these things ring a bell in our present. And I read this to them and I encourage, and I have them read Worsange, Worsange Shears, um, uh, poem where you know the famous lines you know no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark right you know and talk about how um, we saw both her poem and this speech from hundreds of years ago um, that where more is taking these fellow Englishmen to task by saying you know let's say that you got kicked out of your country and your king banished you and you found yourself in this place and you found yourself treated in this way how would you feel to be used thus and he said you know and the last line is like you know and this your mountainish inhumanity you know i end on a note like that to encourage them to you know use these tools at their disposal that like that then as now there was a lot of ugliness but then as now there were people noticing structural um, injustices and speaking out against them. And we can do the same with the tools that we have our, at our disposal and that there's a power to be found in being able to see things clearly. Mm -hmm.